And then, I just want, basically, I just want to thank James very much for putting this show on for me. This is really lovely. I want to thank somebody else who's not here tonight called Joe Knowlesley, who really helped me um, print the screen print, the special edition screen print that's on sale. The special offer during the exhibition, because you can't make it tonight. But anyway, um, the theme is love, and love is, takes many forms and many guises, and love can be sort of tender, it can be lusty, be sexy. It can be love for you know, your family as well as you know, your pets and your um, kids and stuff like that. So all the poems are sort of just around the idea of love. Anyway. Okay? I met this girl in a pub. I asked her what her name was. She said, Swallow. <laughs> <laughs> After she told me, she did a big, exaggerated, but seemingly involuntary <coughs> swallowing motion. <coughs> <laughs> I wondered if this happened each time she said her name out loud. I'm now looking for a girl whose name is Snog. <laughs> 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 we went for a drive in the countryside and saw a fox with a broken leg. It was hobbling in a lay-by. In the car park there was a sickly looking pigeon, bent head down next to a parked car's wheel, not moving, dejected. In town I passed lots of rockabilly type girls. Or were they burlesque dancers? Everyone seems to be a burlesque dancer these days. Some had tattoos on their legs that looked like varicose veins. <laughs> they mostly wore polka dot dresses or jeans with big turn-ups. And they had their hair in ponytails. I'd also seen plenty of young men in old-fashioned clothes with waxed moustaches and short back and sides haircuts. Why would anyone want to look like their granddad? <laughs> or mine for that matter. I also noticed quite a few people with lunatic asylum haircuts. Bambi went to Bristol. When we left her, she hugged me very hard and said, I love you so much, Daddy. The house feels too quiet. There is a daughter-shaped hole, a shape that I know very well because we hugged very often. When I walk through town past the people with haircuts, I sometimes see girls that, that are the same size as her, with similar clothes or shapes, and little flattened noses. That's when my heart leaps. I watched five films this weekend lying on the sofa. I was feeling ill and needed to take it easy. I hobbled to the kitchen like an invalid, cooked rice and vegetables, made a pot of coffee, decaf of course, and crawled up the stairs to spread eagle in the empty bed. I had to leave my dad on Friday, drive two and a half hours back to Worthing, with back and shoulders aching and burning. The chemotherapy made his immune system weak. I couldn't pass the flu on to him or to any of the old people in the nursing home that my mum sat in, saying over and over again, when are you taking me home? Oh, God, that's a bit sad, isn't it? Mm -hmm. It happens. <clears throat> Love is a thing. Walking back down the hill, the town smelled of piss and marijuana. The next train wasn't due for a while. I had a drink in a bar. I saw a girl like a praying mantis. <laughs> Strangely beautiful. She had two friends. One looked like she was wearing a hat. But it was her, her, her hair. Her hair. The other's hairdo was like two slices of rye bread on her head. <laughs> a man stood at the station weeping. Love is a thing. It destroys people when it goes down. When the lights go out, mops flap about in darkness before they rest. Nothing to head for. Some days in your life, you can witness an eclipse or a meteor shower or watch as the moon hovers, huge as a golden frying pan. These things make you know why you carry on doing all this crap. <laughs> <laughs>
In love. I sat opposite the most miserable looking girl I've ever seen. She sighed and tied to herself. She looked like she'd swallowed a whole lemon. Her face twitched with irritation when she looked at me. I felt like a turd. I had to move. But something inside me worried that she might be offended. Why should I care? I stood up at the next station as if I was getting off. I moved to another carriage and sat opposite a couple who were kissing and laughing. They were truly in love. And anyway, I make these little books. I don't get them published, but I sort of self-publish them myself. The Love Glow. A girl came into the pub. She glanced about for a bit before ordering a glass of white wine. She shuffled around and looked a bit awkward. She sat on a bar stool, then stood up. She fiddled in her handbag and checked her mobile phone. She played with her lovely curly black hair and chewed her red lips. Avoiding eye contact with everybody, her skin was beautifully white. In the bar's candlelight, she sat down again and scratched her cute little nose with a painted fingernail. The, breast, the dress she wore was black satin with a small slit in the skirt and a low back which showed her black bra strap. There was a seam down the back of her legs. I secretly hoped she was wearing stockings. She had pretend red flowers in her hair and shiny heels. The door of the pub opened. A shaved ape walked in, <laughs> smelling of an aftershave. He wore a distressed leather blues on jacket and shiny white trainers. He strode straight towards the girl. They embraced and she melted into him. Her pale face gave out a little glow and her whole body became softened. <laughs> Thank you for laughing. <laughs> Bambi. You didn't know that when I saw you glowing in flashing sunlight as you sat feet up on bench outside barber shop and gallery on East Court Square in your new red jacket and cowboy hat after lunch in diner, I stopped for a moment to watch you as through the end of a pair of binoculars. Despite the heat, a two-bar electric fire warmed my restless heart and we'd sat in the brick store pub talking and drawing in my little notepad, designing tattoos, and you wrote, I heart you, in salt on the table. And there's a place for you, in your creative dream world, in your, in your life of loose-limbed golden storms, with your sensitive soul, in a strange new way. A girl with a cold sore kissed her lover goodbye at the train station. He seemed sad to let her go. Once she sat on the train, she made a call with her mobile phone. I couldn't hear what she was saying. She got off the train at Worthing, ran down the platform with a big smile into the arms of another man. Oh. True. True story. <laughs> This is about being in, well, it doesn't matter, I'm, but I was in America with Bambi. When I sat outside the brick store pub on East Court Square after driving out to Little Five Points after Target and Java Monkey, my heart broke a little and I kicked myself because you weren't there. And everywhere we went after that, I imagined you were with us. Hello. <laughs> This is from Idiot. About my daughter Tilda. Your see through arms showed no veins, like dim old fashioned fluorescent light bulbs, your body all fetal positioned on top of the covers. I washed my hands. 
put on the paper gown and stepped up beside you. I sat on the edge of your high up bed, one side barred, cartoon on TV, fan spinning. I tripped on your overnight bag on the floor, spilled your black clothes. Loveliness is never a meagre thing. Its generosity is wondrous, yet burdensome. Its magnet pull brings heartbreak. Sometimes it gives only nausea and that regular seasick feeling in the stomach. Your stomach, the seat of all pain, that extends a cord to the centre of the earth, that you bear with full acceptance, refuse to tug the nighttime kite string, where I see you holding a solemn newborn baby with tender gentleness, your eyes fixated, the world shifted within me, and I woke sobbing for what would never be in our lifetime. There was a time when everything stopped for a moment, a buzzing drone. I took the train each evening after work. I walked over the railway bridge, scared each time I pushed through the double doors. In the dark, lit by security lamps, I told myself it would be alright. Each time I told myself it would all be okay. And I would cradle you and be able to rip out the tube forever. That invader that indicator that caused people to stare in supermarkets, on the street, when you flew down the slide in the park, always a little hesitant in your red, hand-knitted cardigan. You were squirrel chaser, butterfly hunter. You drew pictures of beastly carnage, blood-spattered woodland scenes of rabbits and foxes, flayed and mutilated, the animal holocaust. You were writer of bony hedgerow, fur court, barbed wire, fence poetry, haunting the darkness, scraping the moon with grubby, uncut fingernails. Your father is an idiot, a sentimental fool. I watched you playing in floodplain summer fields, talking to cows and birds and insects, smiling and waving and looking so fine. I don't think you knew when you were in this dream. There are sad young girls who sit in their bedrooms Sunday evenings, melancholic, sometimes weeping softly, listening to sad songs, robins caught on barbed wire. The world is unfair like that. Seagulls stride around, Silent men eat alone on seafront benches. Out at sea, boats split the waves. There are storms and whirlpools, giant octopus, killer sharks. You can't come to terms with things like that. Flowers and chocolate or that little postcard you chose with a picture of a dog on it. That has to be written in your best handwriting. And that's difficult. Now you only text and send emails or type at the computer. You got a really nice fountain pen for your birthday. This card that you wrote is slid in a white envelope. You ask somebody if they have a stamp because the post office only sells books of 12. The postman delivers this post, slips it into the post box lips of a house and then you wait. Am I going on too long? Yeah. No. There's going to be some funny ones. Yes. <laughs> Whenever you have to put that needle in my wrist because the nurse can't do it, I hate you. There is some other feeling I can't speak about this, and that makes me angry. I don't know how I can ever stop it. What is this thing called love? I'm quite organised tonight because I've got these little post-it note things. <laughs> Love can be a terrible thing. The fruit in the bowl had turned mushy and brown. The fridge was half empty. My mother boiled the kettle with no water in it. When I drove her to the hospital, late spring sun splashed across the car windscreen. Skies threatened rain, heavy with possible storms. We went up in the lift. She held my arm and moved slowly with her stick. She had chosen some of the mouldy fruit and put it in a see-through plastic bag. I carried it as we made our way to the ward. 
Dad was sat up in bed, several tubes, pumps and bags around him. He half smiled when he saw me, his son, helping the woman he'd loved all his life, now all fragile and thin. Intolerance eats the soul. Bambi and Poppy got attacked by a gang of chavs on East Worthing Station. I wished I was there. About five years ago, when Bambi was a goth, we were going up the stairs in W.H. Smith. She looked beautiful, with her white hair striking in contrast to her black outfit. A dumpy witch in a peach leisure suit stopped and stared, almost breaking her neck to get a closer look at Bambi. Then she smirked. I said, you shouldn't stare. It makes you fat and ugly. That's why I'm Jack, it's copyrighted. You won't know though. In the pub I talk to the dog about my worries and she looks me in the eye and accepts my kiss. But all she really wants me to do is to scratch her back and give her a packet of pork scratches. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, nearly there. <clears throat> this is quite, um, what's the word? A prefix of the weather. It's called kissing in the rain. It had been raining for a couple of months. Each day brought more. It was like in one of those South American novels that all my fellow students read when I was at college. They called it magic realism. <laughs> News reporters talked excitedly about flood warnings and cancelled events. The TV showed soggy people traipsing dejectedly through mud with bin liners on their feet. People canoeing down their high streets. An old woman with a dog sitting on a garage roof, being filmed from a rescue helicopter. A boy and girl were frantically snogging. I watched them in the waiting room as, at the train station, where everything was dripping and felt damp. They seemed desperate somehow, and as I watched, I imagined them passing a live squid back and forth from one of their mouths to the other. <laughs> It was a strange thought. <laughs> However, last week I'd watched the first two Alien films with Tilda, <laughs> and yesterday I caught the end of Alien vs Predator. In the night I woke trying to think of how I could put all this stuff into a poem. I'd been having a bad dream about trying on a horrible, pale, mushroom-coloured pair of canvas trousers in a clothes shop. <coughs> I think they're known as chinos. Even the shop assistant said they looked bad. <laughs> I fell asleep again. This time lots of beautiful half-naked girls were laughing at my new trousers. <laughs> I woke to the sound of seagulls screaming, like babies being tortured. I came downstairs to make a cup of tea and write this down on my laptop computer. The cat had been sick on the kitchen floor. I didn't tread in it this time. <laughs> the previous evening I'd been out. I visited a couple of bars, each one more clammy and steamy than the previous one. Somebody vomited into their empty pint glass. It almost reached to the top. I was oh. stood behind this giant at the bar. His aftershave was strong and smelled terrible. It made me want to sneeze. And he wouldn't budge, even after he'd been served. There was conversation coming from his wet clothes like he'd just run the Grand National. The music sounded like they were having building work done next door. <laughs> Rain was still falling, people sat outside under the pub's giant umbrellas, smoking and staring into the gutters and gurgling drains, as if it might tell their fortunes. Cars swooped past in slow motion, 
the street was running with water. A girl sat cross-legged on a bench. She was talking to her friend. Her eyes were wide open and looked a bit mad. She had dreadlocks and a big ethnic scarf wrapped around her neck and shoulders. Even in the fresh wet night air, the scent of patchouli hovered around her like midges or flies around cow dung. <laughs> I heard about her talking about saving up and going to India to travel around. She had a desire to find herself. She wanted her soul to be touched. She would like somebody to touch her great spiritual asshole. <laughs> My umbrella was broken, so I stuffed it under the table and got drowned again walking to the station. On the train home, my clothes were steaming, and I thought twice about coming into town again. Thank you. <laughs> well, thank you so much. Just a couple more, and then you can relax. This was being in America last year. Late afternoon sun splashed the top of the trees. Somebody had turned the colour up. It was unbelievable. Bright red, flame orange and Naples yellow. I was with Ruth in Decatur, Georgia. We'd watch TV after lunch. And before that we did all the nearby thrift stores. I liked the American programmes on TV. There were lots of them. Chat shows, UFO investigations, real life ghost stories and great commercials too. The local news came on. A reporter stood at the side of a major highway. She was holding a broomstick. I thought it might have something to do with Halloween, but it was a story about a high school janitor. He was fired for filming students in the toilet. He'd fitted tiny cameras to the end of broomsticks, which were leant against the toilet walls. <laughs> Sean had to go and see somebody. I went to the bar that Bambi and I used to go to five years ago. We had great times then. It was strange to be here again without her company. I had a few beers alone at the bar and recalled the hours that we spent chatting, designing the tattoo that shocked you when I got back. I was happy then. And I was getting happy again now, drinking thousands of miles from home. Yes, I was on the cusp of joy, but often I feel anxious. I sometimes feel that I'm going to vomit with an unexplained fear and panic that sits in my stomach like a dead animal. I wish I could get more settled. I went outside and had a smoke in the low autumn sunshine. There were two women at an outdoor table drinking wine. They were smoking too. I stood close to them so I could hear their conversation. He likes to get violent during sex, one of them said. But he hasn't broken my skin yet, her friend laughed. I caught mine going through my closet, she responded. He was stroking my underwear. <laughs> Despite my usual anxiety, I felt then that life was fantastic in its variety. I was getting drunk and saw that everybody was just scratching around trying to find some fleeting pleasure, seeking their own nirvana. A group of younger girls arrived at the door of the bar. One of them poked her head inside. She said to her friends, it's bumping, and they all went in. <laughs> I had another cigarette and leant against the wall. Three men came out. They looked like serious drinkers. Two of them wandered off to another bar across the square. The remaining man started talking to me. Most people I'd met here were friendly. He was dressed like an off-duty policeman with a leather bomber jacket. He teamed this with a shirt and tie. He was attending a conference in Atlanta, and he did indeed work for the police department. He said that he and his two colleagues were, colleagues were from South Carolina, and liked to come here because of the booze, the food, and the women. He told me his wife was English, and that she was a terrorist. <laughs> well, she terrorises me, he added, <laughs> without smiling. I went back inside and had a good look around and another drink or two, remembering certain times and forgetting others. I was full of confidence, and I felt I could talk to anybody. The previous day, I'd also watched TV. 
while Ruth was at her studio and Sean was in his office. I sat by the window and out the corner of my eye I noticed things falling outside. I turned to look and I thought I would see snow, but it was autumn leaves falling slowly from the golden trees. Swooping gently across my vision, the same movement of snowfall, which provoked a similar recognition and emotion in my brain. My girls were across the Atlantic Ocean. Snow was fun and exciting when they were younger. Now, apart from the first fresh hushed feathering and floating, it swiftly becomes boring and then frustrating. It's hard to get around. The pretty whiteness soon turns muddy and slushy, and your feet are always damp and cold, a long way from those deep-seated romantic feelings about clear and crisp evenings, and clear, star-lit, frosty skies, untouched snow sparkling on the streets and across fields. It will soon be winter. I'm drunk and I love everybody. <laughs> I'm getting older. In a couple of weeks, the trees will be bare and leafless. Couples will hold gloved hands. Birds will look for, will look for food in the hard ground. Garden foxes will go through your rubbish bins. A young man will go back to his cold and lonely room, sit at the desk, and while tree branches scratch his window, he will write a letter to a particular woman for the very last time. Thank you. Oh. <laughs> Last one. Oh, my truth. <laughs> Thank you very much for listening. This will be my last one. It was that special day, you know the one, the day when you realise that winter is finally over. You wait on a train platform at dusk and still feel warmed. The light is different, birds sing. There is a joyful ache in your heart and in your testicles. <laughs> Warehouses and office blocks have their windows open. Dark descends more softly outside the train's windows. You think about people you'd seen earlier. An old man stood at the bar like a scarecrow. Tall and skinny as a bamboo cane, skin stretched tight across his skull, like he had no muscle. He also had no lips, and his eyes were sunken. It made you depressed just to look at him. He was wearing a broken down brown suit and drank steadily into his hollow, papery, lipless face. Next to him was a flabby man in shirt sleeves. His face was pink and blotchy like bacon. He sweated and looked like he would smell of bacon if you got too close. You kept your distance. He was sitting on a stool reading a newspaper, grasping it with fat baby fingers. After a while, he put the paper down, he placed it on the bar, then he buried his face in his hands. His body slumped and shook. He wept silently, crying into his chubby paws. An obese man on a mobility scooter was moving between the tables, knocking, <laughs> knocking chairs out of the way. He'd been outside for a cigarette, and he seemed too big for his vehicle. There was tennis on the TV as the sunlight blasted in, making it difficult to see the screen. It was late afternoon. Cars lined up at the level crossing outside. Red lights flashing and sirens beeping. Drivers desperate to get home they were where they would pour a drink in the garden and light a diesel-fired barbecue that stinks up the washing drying on the line and comes in through the cat flap. <coughs> you leave that fat man crying into his hands and get the train to Brighton. You start drinking early because you had a busy and stressful week. It was Friday. You got to the pub for happy hour. Later you meet some people you hadn't seen for ages. They were at an exhibition opening. It wasn't very inspiring. You all went for a pizza and some drinks and then to another bar where they had a terrible DJ playing terrible music. It was far too loud. It was difficult to hold a conversation. There was a group of women out on a hen night in random fancy dress, tired-looking nurses, 
cowgirls and sad angels with pink wings. Despite the music being so loud, you still heard your wife calling you a wanker. You didn't understand because all evening you'd been charming, friendly, generous, buying drinks and joining in discussions. You got to the station just after midnight. The train pulled out slow and sure. Carriages stinking of kebabs and burgers. Lots of shouting and laughing. I used to think that every living thing needed the sunshine to survive. But then I thought about those weird creatures that live at the bottom of the ocean. And those people who sit and watch football in dark pubs. Who so readily and easily turn into bigots. Thank you very much for listening. Thank you very much, Gary. Thank you very much for your fantastic observations and for all the work that you've oh, put into yes. this show, which is fantastic. I think it's probably the best show we've had here of yours. Oh, and it carries on till the 1st of March. So everybody wants to spread the word. Thank you. Thank you.